Hi everyone, and welcome back to History of Sexuality. This week in class, we're going to begin talking about sexology, a scientific discipline devoted to the study of human sexuality. Sexology first emerged in the late 19th century, and it resulted in the creation of an entirely new language of sexual desire and behavior. Much of this language is still with us today. Indeed, it would not be a stretch to say that, for better or worse, our modern ways of classifying and organizing sexuality are heavily indebted to sexology. In lots of ways, then, contemporary sexual cultures bear the mark of sexology. Given all of this, it seems prudent to spend a fair amount of time examining sexology. And in fact, this is what we're going to do. I've decided to devote the next three weeks of class to this topic, and in our investigations, we're going to look at sexology from lots of different angles. Among other things, we'll explore sexology's entanglements with race, gender, and class, its relationship with imperialism and Western colonial expansion, and the way doctors and scientists from all across the world adapted and reformulated sexological theories and practices. One of the reasons we can do these things is because sexology looms large in the historiography of sexuality. Indeed, it is probably the best studied and most written about topic in all of the scholarship in this field. Today, as we begin our journey through some of this scholarship, we're going to take up some basic questions. Who were these sexologists? Where did they come from? And why were they so interested in subjecting sex to scientific study? What explains the emergence of this new discipline in the late 1800s? And what were some of the social and cultural forces that influenced its formation and early development? As these questions indicate, what we're going to do today is sketch out sexology's historical foundations. By drawing attention to the sociocultural context in which this new field of study appeared, we'll learn about the assumptions, methodologies, and pre-existing ideological currents that guided sexology as it developed over the course of the late 19th and early 20th century. So, to our first question, who were the sexologists? The field's founders generally hailed from Western Europe, and more specifically, Germany and England. In terms of their disciplinary backgrounds, the world's first sexologists were quite a diverse lot. Some came to sexology from the medical profession. Others were psychiatrists. Still others came from outside of medicine, from journalism, the law, or simply as intellectuals and writers. As you can see from the images on the screen here, most of the field's founders were men. But with the passage of time, women gradually entered the field. The first books in this nascent field were published between the 1870s and 1890s. By the early 1900s, sexology had crystallized into a formal academic discipline, complete with a scholarly publication, the Journal of Sexology, founded in 1908, and specific research centers, the most famous of which was Magnus Hirschfeld's Institute for Sexology, which flourished in Berlin from 1919 to 1933, when the Nazis destroyed it. If sexology's pioneers spanned the gamut in terms of their occupational and social backgrounds, it should also be said that their specific interests and attitudes towards sexuality were also quite varied. Some, like Ricard von Kraft Ebbing, concentrated their research on what we would today call paraphilias, that is, less common or unusual sexual interests. In his book Psychopathia Sexualis, Kraft Ebbing coined a number of terms to describe the atypical forms of sexual arousal he observed in his day-to-day -day practice. Many other sexologists wrote exclusively about homosexuality, which at the time went by various names not just homosexuality, but also uranianism, sexual inversion, antipathic sexual instinct, and psychosexual hermaphroditism. 
Here, the overarching focus was on male-male sexual desire and behavior. Views of this diverged significantly. In his early writings, Kraft Ebbing pathologized patients who exhibited homosexual desires and behaviors, which he regarded as perversions of the normal, healthy sexual instinct. At the other end of the spectrum, Edward Carpenter argued that because they combined the best elements of masculinity and femininity, homosexuals were more evolved, more advanced, superior to heterosexuals. Having learned about sexology's many different starting points and about some of the disagreements that characterize the field, you may be asking yourself, what held this field together? What was it, if anything, that unified sexology's diverse practitioners? Good question. The bedrock principle of sexology was that human sexuality was a biological phenomenon. Instead of interpreting sexuality in moral or religious terms, sexologists saw it as a matter of health and disease. As such, they interpreted sexual normalcy and deviance in terms of what was thought to be biologically normal and abnormal. And deviance was their foremost concern. As a group, sexologists never took up the subject of quote-unquote normal sexuality. In their writings, heterosexuality was the natural default setting for humankind. What interested them were divergences from this unexamined, assumed standard. And when classifying these various marginal or peripheral sexualities, they did so through terms, the pervert, the homosexual, the masochist, the frigid woman, etc., they believed to represent actual people in the world. That is to say, they regarded them as distinct human types, as stable categories of being, as species. Their individual sexual identities were said to be the product of either disease or degeneracy. Subsuming their subjects under the jurisdiction of medicine, the sexologists medicalized human sexuality. They did this largely in the pursuit of greater tolerance for and acceptance of human sexual diversity. Embracing a liberationist aim, the field as a whole sought to emancipate sexual minorities through changes in laws, policies, and public attitudes that would bring about greater freedoms, particularly for homosexuals. For the sexologists, the best way to advocate on behalf of these individuals was through the medical model, which moved their sexualities out of the realm of morality and placed it within that of biology and medicine. This gets us to our next question. Where did sexology come from? And what were some of the social and cultural forces that propelled its emergence? One of the key influences here was Charles Darwin. Darwin's theories of evolution challenged the dominant creationist viewpoint of the 19th century, which held that humankind, like all other species, had been created exactly as they were today by God. In contrast with this, Darwin said that species evolved over time in response to changes in their surrounding environments. This was the theory of natural selection, and a big part of it was Darwin's theory of sexual selection. If natural selection was about the struggle for existence, sexual selection was about the struggle for mates. As Darwin had it, Sexual selection explained sexual dimorphism, that is, the phenomena by which the males and females of a species come to have different physical characteristics. When looking to explain why, for example, male birds have more colorful plumage than females of the same species, Darwin argued that this was the result of female birds' preference for bright feathers. This was a rather radical idea. Darwin's argument that physical attraction, lust, and sexual desire were biological in nature was quite shocking to mid-19th century readers, many of whom believed that things like beauty were created by God for human delight. Despite this, 
Darwin's ideas prompted other scientists, including medical doctors and psychologists, to start thinking about human sexual variation in naturalistic, evolutionary terms. We can see some of this thinking in the writings of Carl Ulrichs, an early sexologist who, in 1870, authored a pamphlet calling upon the German government to, quote, free the nature of the earning from penal law. The term earning was something that Ulrichs coined. He used it when talking about homosexual males, or, as he put it, a feminine male attracted to a man. Looking at the excerpt from this on the screen, you can see how often Ulrichs invokes nature as a cause of human sexual variation. This is an early formulation of what we would today call the born this way argument, and it signaled a shift in European thinking about sexuality. In large part because of Darwin's ideas, a biological model of sexuality emerged, and this has remained in place in Western cultures ever since. Evolutionary biology, then, had a formative impact on sexology. Working within a Darwinian framework, sexologists saw human sexuality as something that was a product of evolution and that was continually subject to evolutionary forces. It was for this reason that Richard von Kraft Ebbing interpreted homosexuality as a sign of degeneration. He believed that homosexuals represented a less evolved form of humanity, beings that had reverted to a more primitive stage of existence. In this, he was not unique. Degeneration theory was in fact all the rage in 19th century Europe, as countless intellectuals and scientists were convinced that human physical and mental health was regressing. The biological language of decline that Kraft Ebbing tapped into found expression in many different scientific fields. Degeneration theorists taught that everywhere one looked, one saw signs of people reverting to ancestral types, or what at the time was called atavism. Indeed, homosexuals were believed to be just one kind of evolutionary throwback. Also lumped in with them were prostitutes, criminals, and a variety of other quote-unquote social undesirables, whose existence and purportedly growing numbers were said to reflect the negative impacts industrialization and urbanization were having on European populations. Another place we can see evolutionary biology's impact on sexology is in regards to theories of bisexuality. In some very interesting ways, Bisexuality was at the very heart of sexologists' explanation of the emergence of different kinds of sexual types. Like Darwin, they believed that the sexual maturation of the human species involved an early recapitulation of a universal hermaphroditic phase manifested via bisexual cravings and behavior. As evidence of the fact that the ancestors of the human race were all bisexual, they pointed to the existence of relatively unevolved creatures throughout the animal kingdom, many of which were thought to exhibit bisexuality. As the theory went, because bisexuality was the most primitive form of sexuality, it naturally disappeared with advances in human evolution, which accelerated the process of sexual dimorphism and led to the creation of people whose near-exclusive desires were for those of the opposite sex. This notion of erotic speciation helped sexologists peg bisexuals as another kind of evolutionary throwback. And interestingly, while heterosexuals and homosexuals were regarded as distinct species, this was not thought to be true of bisexuals. In this sense, we can say that sexology participated in bisexuality's erasure. All right, that's all we've got time for right now. I hope by now you're starting to understand what sexology was all about and where it came from. In our next lecture, we're going to go a bit deeper, exploring sexology's intersections with racial science, eugenics, and imperialism. But for now, let's keep things right here. I've got some questions on the screen I'd like you to address in our first discussion of the week, 
Once you've got some ideas, go ahead and share your posts.